So here we are, um, the Diatom Web Academy 2022. It's now um, more, you know, we're going on three years of this event that we started at the beginning of, actually started a little bit before the pandemic. And we found that this is just such a nice way to connect with each other, learn of each other's research, have a little conversation and um, encourage everyone. So thank you for encouraging me during these trying times. And this has also been um, just a really added bonus to be able to learn from each other um, and share our research. Um, first, I'll talk about next week, um, or no, in two weeks, um, Matt Ashworth will be presenting on Odontella or Bidolfia. So you can check the Diatom Web Academy schedule for that talk and upcoming talks that we have throughout the spring of 2022. And um, for today, um, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker. Um, and I'm going to pause because I'm trying to pronounce his name correctly. Tumaini Kamulai, who goes by Tuma. I know I didn't get it right, but I'm trying. <laughs> Is a PhD student at the University of Arizona. He's working with Dr. Andy Cohen in the Paleolimnology Lab. Tuma did his bachelor's degree in fisheries science at Sokoine University in Tanzania and went on to work at the Tanzania Fisheries Research Institute. The Institute conducts research in the East African Great Lakes of Victoria, Tanganyika, and Malawi and the Western Indian Ocean. Um, Tuma has worked on at the research station on various projects. Um, but he's been now at University of Arizona. Um, he completed his master's degree there and now working on a PhD. Um, Tuma is going to speak to us today about Holocene productivity of Southern Lake Tanganyika inferred from diatom fossils. Um, welcome Tuma and thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much, Sarah, for the introduction, <clears throat> and thanks everyone for attending. So if, if there's anyone who is new to diatoms, basically these are phytoplankton. Uh, these are the most abundant organisms on Earth. They're usually found in aquatic ecosystems. And uh, this, what you are seeing here, is a cavinula from Lake Tanganyika. Somebody said in the chat that, they, that they've seen it before. Uh, so these are really cool and I may not go so much into the taxonomy of the datums. Today I'll mostly be talking about how we use datums for environmental reconstruction. So I'll first take you on a tour to East Africa so we can see exactly where Lake Tanganyika is. Uh, it's found in the eastern, in the Rift Valley of East Africa, and it's just one of the many lakes that are found in the East African Rift Valley. It's right here, and uh, in the East African Rift Valley, actually, there are many lakes, and uh, it's about 10 lakes found in the East African Rift Valley, and most of these lakes actually share the same characteristics with Lake Tanganyika. So most of the research that we do on Lake Tanganyika is also applicable to most of these lakes because most of them are meromictic just like Lake Tanganyika that's to say they depend on wind strength to mix their lakes and bring nutrients up and uh, also most of them are orientated on the north-south axis so they are kind of affected the same way by the wind and the stratification so Lake Tanganyika is basically it's the longest lake in the world. It's about 673 kilometers in the north-south axis. So this is very important when we are dealing with Lake Tanganyika to know its length, 
because this tells us that it actually cuts across many climatic regions between three degrees and nine degrees south. It's one of the, it's actually the second oldest lake in the world, about nine to 12 million years. And uh, through all this time, it has, it, it has undergone a lot of evolution and so many species are found in the lake. And it's about 1,470 meters deep. It's the world's second deepest. And I hope you can all appreciate how deep 1,470 meters is. It actually has the largest, second largest volume of an oxycod as after, after the Black Sea. And also it's the world's second largest by volume. So in all these cases, it's taken to only Lake Baikal found in Siberia. And Lake Tanganyika has so many species of animals, plants, and protozoa. It has actually about 250 fish species, has about 367 species of diatoms that have been described. And there's probably a lot that we don't know. And uh, most of these diatoms are not probably not endemic. We are not so sure, but some of them are. So there's a lot of diatoms as we shall be seeing today. We may not discuss all the 367 species, but we can see that diatoms have been used intensively in studying Lake Tanganyika. So the lake is divided into three bathymetric basins, the Northern Basin, the Central Basin, and the Southern Basin. It's believed that these were different lakes back in time on a geological time scale. So basically there's a way that these three basins somehow behave differently as we shall see. And that's, that was one of the reasons as to why we are dealing specifically with the Southern Basin. So Lake Tanganyika is very important to the regional economy of East Africa. It's bordered by three countries and people living around the lake heavily depend on the fisheries resources for their livelihood and also as a source of protein. It said that up to 40% of the protein is provided by the pelagic fishery. So when we talk about the pelagic fishery, we mean the fishery, the offshore fishery. So these are deep water species. And uh, it's mainly, although I said the lake contains about 250 species, there are only about three species, if not two, that are of great importance to the people living around the lake. We have the slick lattice, that's lattice tapesi right here. And also we have it here in the market. So this is how it looks like. And also we have the sardines, Stolotrisa tanganikai. And usually these ones are dried and sold in the market as they look down here. So you can use this one right here for scale. And so many people enjoy this and uh, the sardines are usually sold dry, but if you know how to cook them, then they are really so nice. So the pelagic fisher is really of importance in East Africa. And uh, as we study the lake, we are trying to see how the lake, how we can ensure, I mean, how we can let the governments and people know about the future of the fishery so they know they know if they can continuously depend on the lake or something else might happen. So we have a reason to study this, not just for scientific knowledge. But now, actually, as I said, the, many people depend on the lake, but now there's a problem. Data from the UNDP says that over 10 million people depend on the lake for livelihood and also as a source of protein. And also the Global Nature Fund designated this as a threatened lake of the year 2017. And this is a, a biodiversity hotspot. But we are seeing that there is increase in fishing pressure, as you can see right here, up to 300.5%. I mean, 305%, and that was between 1995 and 2011. So if we are to go to 2020, probably this would go up to 500%. And this research was done only in Burundi, which has a small part of the lake. If it was done in Tanzania or Congo, who share almost 90% of the lake, maybe the values would even be higher than this. So this is a problem. Fishing effort is increasing, but catch 
is decreasing. That means the productivity is decreasing. So this is a huge problem and this is what we are actually trying to address. So somebody said that the problem here is because of overfishing. That was Molsa. And that's true. As you can see, an increase of 305% that is overfishing. But then we also have another question. The Sister Lake Victoria has more fishing than Lake Tanganyika, but there is less worry about Lake Victoria than Lake Tanganyika. Just because Lake Victoria is shallower, has a higher surface area, and is more productive than Lake Tanganyika. So the point here is both are being overfished, but Lake, Lake Tanganyika is having a bigger problem than Lake Victoria. So that means the problem is actually productivity, although fishing pressure is just making the problem worse. So there is something that's actually setting the threshold for fishing effort. You go above the threshold, that's overfishing. So the threshold for Lake Tanganyika is very low. Reason being that it's less productive than Lake Victoria. And so why is it less productive? And if it's less productive today, is it being affected by climate change? And if yes, then what do we expect in the future? Because we expect climate change to be worse in the future. So that's basically what we are investigating. And uh, before we dive into that, I will first let you understand how the ecosystem works. I know most of you know this, but I want to explain exactly how the ecosystem works so we understand how climate change could affect such ecosystems. So usually nutrients get into the lake from whatever sources like atmospheric deposition or from the shores or rivers getting in. And then these nutrients go down into the lake. So assuming this is Lake Tanganyika, so the nutrients go down. But diatoms and phytoplankton in general usually live at the surface of the lake because they need light. Now the nutrients are down and the phytoplankton are up. So there must be a way for the nutrients to come from down to the surface so the phytoplankton can use the nutrients. Now, usually this is a normal process if a leg mixes completely. Either it's at high altitudes or it's a shallow lake that it's very easy to mix, but not for Lake Tanganyika. So the nutrients in Lake Tanganyika are mostly down. And as you know, this is a tropical lake, meaning that the temperature is almost kind of the same all year round. And it's a warm climate. So basically the surface waters of the lake are warmer than the bottom waters of the lake. So this causes a density difference such that there is no mixing between the epilimnion, that's the surface, and the hypolimnion, that's below the surface. So then the nutrients cannot go up if there is no mixing. And the phytoplankton are up, but they need the nutrients. So in such a case, then you'll have low productivity if the lake is stratified. Now, this lake depends on mixing, at least when winds mix the lake, kind of mix it mechanically, that's when the nutrients can get up and uh, provide, the nutrients can come up and then the diatoms can use the nutrients, which doesn't usually happen for Lake Tanganyika until the dry season. So in the tropics, usually we talk about the dry season and wet season, but basically the dry season in the tropics, I mean, below the equator is usually the Southern hemisphere winter. So during the months of April to September, at times May to October, that's the dry season. And because this is close to the equator, usually they are southerly, the, the southeasterly winds usually push this water beginning from the southern end of the lake across the 673 kilometers towards the north. So usually the wind will be about seven meters per second, but also there are gusts up to like 12 meters per second, pushing this water from the south towards the north. So basically everything starts in the southern end of the lake. So as the warm water is pushed up, the nutrients then in the hypolimnion come up to the surface in a process called upwelling. So as these winds continue pushing for about three to four months, 
you will have all these surface warm water kind of going to the north. And that means the thermocline in the south will come up and at times it outcrops. And then in the north, you have the thermocline actually going deeper. So there is movement of water in the surface uh, here from the south towards the north. And then in the north, the warm water actually goes down. So after about three weeks, following the dry season, you will have the water from the south, the nutrients that are boiled in the south, reaching the northern end. And also, as the warm water goes down here, it creates internal waves, which cause secondary upwelling. So it's usually during the dry season that the lake tries to mix. Now, this is assuming that the stratification is not too intense and the winds are strong enough. But with climate change, assuming that the temperature has increased and the winds are not strong enough, that means there's less nutrients that will come to the surface. So basically everything starts in the south and then takes a couple of months to reach the northern end. And that's why you will see that productivity will begin in the south and then move towards the north because nutrients will take some time to get to the north. So this is how the system works. Now, our worry is if the temperature increases and if the winds, if the temperature increases and the winds either don't increase or they decrease, then it may take several years without the lake getting enough nutrients. And if it takes a couple of years without the lake getting nutrients, then we are worried that the entire ecosystem could probably shut down. So basically that's why we are doing all this research. So we are not the first to do this research. There are other people who have done it. But given the nature of the lake, as I said, it's very long and it's more accessible from the northern end. Remember, this is a Rift Valley Lake. So the walls around the mountain, are, I mean, the walls around the lake are mountainous. So it's not accessible from every point. Usually most of the researchers can access the lake from the northern end. It will take thousands of dollars to get a ship from up, do research along the entire lake out to the south. So if you have limited funding, the best thing you will do is just to do research in the north. And then after that, you will conclude that, okay, this is how the lake behaves. But our question is, is the northern end really the same as the southern end? Is the southern end equally affected by climate variability? That was our main question. So what we did was to take cores from the southern basin, analyze the cores, and then compare with the northern end of the lake. Now, today I won't bring up all the data that we used for comparing. That's data from other researchers in the northern end of the lake. But what I can tell you is that most of the researchers concluded that climate change is affecting Lake Tanganyika. Those who did the northern end of the lake, also those who did the central part of the lake, concluded that the lake is being affected by climate change. So we want to see if the southern end is really also being affected by climate change. So we had two cores, one we called it 2A, the other one 6A. These are just conventional names. This one was 420 meters water depth, and this was 680 meters of water depth. Now for a diatomist, if you look at this core, it's kind of interesting. You can see from the bottom of the core, you see diatom laminations down here. And already you can tell that something's cooking. Down here, you see all these laminations. As you go up, you kind of lose the laminations. Core 6A wasn't really laminated. And both cores also had tephra, so this volcanic ash from an eruption that uh, happened south of the lake many years back. So this is how our cores looked like. And we did analysis on these cores. And we had a pretty good, robust edge model. We had enough edge control points. We did carbon-14 dating. And we found that core 6A was between 0 and 8,200 years BP, calibrated years BP, BP. And also, we had 2A between 200 and 1,400. Now, we lost part of the top of the core here. That was so unfortunate. 
but that's how it is. So we have two A between 200 and 1,400. So we did uh, multi-proxy analysis of the cores, but mainly our results had at least 118 species of diatoms, that was for 2A, and, fifth, and uh, 52 for 6A. Now I have these diatoms to the right. Uh, the very first one here is our Coursera, then we have a Psychostephanos Damasia, we have a Gonfonima Cleve, and then it's Yalacastris. Now, I'm sorry I didn't have a good image for the Nitsi Alacastris because most of them were broken. So I didn't get a good SEM image. It was mostly showing just a small section that could not tell you exactly what that data means. So I wanted to put this one, which shows the shape, so we can compare the Nitsi Alacastris with all the other diatoms. Now, usually during good times when the lake mixes well, we expect the lake to be dominated by our Coursera and Psychostephanos. These are the heavily silicified ones. There are many species of our Coursera. I cannot tell with certainty exactly which species this is, but we had these species and Psychostephanos dominating core 6A, and then we had Nitsia lacastris dominating core 2A. Now, usually if the times are bad or like when the lake is more stratified, we expect the Nitsia lacastris to dominate the system. So we expect as climate change advances, we expect a shift from the heavily silicified to the lightly silicified diatoms. And just to remind you, uh, the Rocosera and Psychostephanos actually have a lower silica to phosphorus ratio requirement compared to the Nitsia Lacastris, which has a higher silica to phosphorus ratio requirement. So of course, there are other nutrients that play part like nitrogen and other factors. And of course, the southern end and the northern end has different diatom assemblages. So there's a lot to this, but at least we can get a general idea from using these diatoms about the PDO environment. So these are the diatoms we had. Now, Gonfonima cleve is a periphytic diatom. We don't expect to find a lot of it at a depth of 420 or like 680. So finding it actually is a good story. And I have it here because we we'll realize that we found Gonfonima cleve at these very deep sites. So we shall discuss that later. And uh, we also did other fossils, ostracods and fish fossils. But for today, I won't be going deep into the ostracods and fish fossils. We also did some geochemistry of XRF manganese. So I put this picture of an ostracod here, Cypridopsis species, so that if you've never seen an ostracod, this is how it looks like. Basically, this is a crustacean, which uh, usually stays at the bottom and it's always eating like in organic matter. It's carnivorous. It's also eat uh, scavenger as well. So usually the ostracods live at the bottom. That means they need oxygen to live. So finding ostracods at the bottom of a lake means that there was oxygen. So they kind of tell us about the uh, oxycline dynamics of the lake. So let's get into results. Uh, so we have, this is core 2A first, and we have diatom concentration being the first graph up here. And you can see if we put a trend line, we see a decrease from the bottom of the core towards the top of the core. Now, I know this can be challenging to use diatom concentration to determine productivity of a leg, it's more of a problem when you have so many types of diatoms of different masses and different requirements. But here we decided to depend on diatom concentration metrics because we have mostly one diatom species which is dominating the system. So we have diatom concentration decreasing of mostly one diatom species. We have a few episodes where we see Psychostephanos showing up but usually this happens because you know the lake is kind of in dynamics. So at times when the nutrient status of the lake changes, you expect to see other diatoms as well show up. But generally you can tell that this core was really dominated to almost 
by Nitzel Castroes. And we see the diatom concentration decreasing towards the top of the core. Now, I know this one is uh, not, uh, the decrease here is not so clear, but at least you can tell that there was a general decrease. Also here, we have a gonfonema clave. Now, you will see later why we use the gonfonema clave, why we plotted it right here. So basically, we, you know, the system was dominated by Nitzia castroes, Psychostephanus, and gonfonema clave, and of course, other species, but they were, they contributed so very small values that they were not significant to plot. And uh, like I said, we also did the ostracods and manganese to determine the oxycline dynamics. And uh, we see right here in the yellow box that we had ostracods showing up here. And also we have a few peaks of manganese correlating with the ostracods. Now this tells us that there was oxygen at the bottom. That's what the ostracods tell us. And the manganese tells us that at least oxygen crossed the thermocline into the hypolimnion. Now the question is, how were these organisms able to live at a 420 meter water depth? While we, for today, the lake is only oxygenated to 300 meters, like how did the oxygen get down there? The question is, was the mixing so strong that the oxygen made it to the bottom of the lake? Now, we are not so sure, but that, that would be the first guess. Now, looking at the gonfonema clave, which is a periphytic data, which we don't expect to find at this depth, we see that it also kind of correlates with the presence of the ostracods and also the peaks in manganese. So already this tells us something. How did the gonfonema clave get to this site? Because we don't expect it to be produced at this site. Usually these are diatoms that grow attached to macrophytes. Now, how did they get to this depth? So this tells us that there is something that brought the gonfonema clave to this site. Now you may ask, why don't we say whatever brought the gonfonema clave also brought the ostracods? Well, when we analyze the ostracods, we realize that these are very deep species of ostracods, so they are not coming from shallow sites. But at the same time, these ostracods were found intact and they are very delicate. If they were to be dragged from the littoral part of the lake to this depth, they would all be found broken. So we found that they were intact in their deep water species. So probably these were living down here. So whatever brought the gonfonema clave didn't bring the ostracods, but brought something that favored the ostracods. Now, what exactly that is, we'll find out soon. So we did also 6A and 6A at least comes to about 1950. So this was more of an advantage considering the 19th century change in climate. So we have here also the datum concentration kind of decreasing towards the top of the core. And we see that it's datum concentration of mostly the heavily silicified datums, which have almost the same kind of requirements. So this was a good metric to use to discuss the productivity of the leg because we are seeing it's decreasing and it's mostly of the diatoms that have almost the same requirements that's turbulence and high nutrients, high phosphorus. So we see that it was mostly dominated by our Coserin cyclostephanus. And then towards like the 19th century, we see that that's when the Nitzia lacastra starts showing up. Again, we've plotted gonfonema clave here for a reason. So we see there is this decrease in our Coursera while Psychostephanos increases and then Psychostephanos decreases and then Nitzia lacastra speaks up here about 1,500 pp. And Tierney et al. 2010 said that warming of Lake Tanganyika started to be observed about 500 AD, which is about 1,500 pp. So we see that this is in line with what others say, although it may not be the exact timing and the warming might be slightly different, the magnitude of the warming might be slightly different. So we see also here at the same time is where we see this gonfonema clave show up. So to begin with, already here we are seeing that 
we are starting to get indicators of stratification towards the end here, towards 1950 uh, AD. And we are seeing we are having a reduction in, in the atom concentration. So here we can already tell that there's a decrease in productivity, but the Bonfonima Cleve again, we'll use it sometime later. And uh, if you are to compare 2A and 6A, basically this is the time you compare. And as we see that 2A had Nitsia dominating, this is the time when we started seeing the Nitsia, the Nitsia lacastrois in our 6A core. So this is the comparable time period with 2A. So like I said, we also did the manganese and the ostracods. And as you can see, here the ostracods and manganese also tell us that there was some oxygen at the bottom of the lake. Now, this is 680, the other one was 420, but how does oxygen make it to 680? Like how, how possible is that? So this was our main question. And if we are to answer this question without going deeper, we would easily say that, okay. So in the past mixing was really strong compared to now. So probably the winds were stronger then than now. Yeah, we might be correct, but we decided to go further and investigate also using diatoms. Now, it's not a coincidence that it's the same time again, like 2A, that we had Gonfonima Cleve appearing here. And Gonfonima Cleve dominated to almost to very high values. And this is like 12 kilometers offshore. So we realized that something here tells us about the oxygen that was found at these sites. There's just no coincidence that when you don't have value, when you don't have any ostracods, no almost no manganese, and then you don't have the gonfonema cleve, and then they all show up at the same time. So this ostracod gonfonema cleve was actually very, very helpful in telling us something about what exactly had happened. And now that's what I'm, so we came to, some kind of conclusion that it's not just the deep vertical mixing that provided the oxygen to the ostracods, but there is something that brought the gonfonema cleve that also brought the oxygen because we also found that these were deep water species and they were intact. So they were living here. So we realized that oxygen was being brought to them by another mechanism other than deep vertical mixing. So in Lake Tanganyika, there is a, a river that flows into the northern end of the lake. It comes from Lake Kivu, north of Lake Tanganyika, one of the lakes we saw in the map of East Africa. That lake is at about 1,500 meters above sea level. So it's way higher at higher elevation than Lake Tanganyika, which is about 773 meters above sea level. So that river actually contains colder water than what's found in Lake Tanganyika. And also it has more sediment, so it brings in sediment here. Now, when this river comes into this lake, it actually goes down because the water is colder and so it's denser. So it just goes down the lake. And divers who have done a couple of diving in this lake have found that if you dove down, then you'd find that the, the colored water that comes from the river actually goes down into the lake. But just because this end of the lake is shallower, it doesn't make it so far before it surfaces. So we believe that whatever was is happening here, because this water is cold, but it's more oxygen rich than the water of the lake. So we also believe that what's happening today in the north here is probably what was happening sometime back in the south here. Remember that this place here is so mountainous. So probably there were streams that were flowing from, from the land into the lake and were bringing in colder water that was flowing down to very deep sites like 6A and 2A. So probably these streams were the ones that were taking the gonfonema with them, but also we are taking the oxygen with them that supported the ostracods to live there. And as we see also, manganese tells us there was enough oxygen. So we believe that what's happening today here is what was happening then down here.
So we came to a few conclusions, as I told you, that we were comparing the northern and the southern end of the lake. And we realized that basically the southern end, as we saw in our graphs, that it's also affected by climate variability and hydrodynamics. But we also realized that there is a difference in timing and magnitude of all these events, the north versus the south. But as you may have seen, the atoms are a really strong tool in assessing period environmental changes, but a multiprox approach is actually a stronger tool because you can see here we used ostracods and diatoms and manganese and other tools to reconstruct the period environment. And we realized that it actually gave us more information. So we see the power of the diatom to tell us about the ostracods. So basically, this was our research. And uh, I would like to thank all the institutions that contributed towards this research. Uh, the funding sources, mainly NSF. I would like to thank my advisor, Andy Cohen, who is on the call. And also, I would like to thank you all for attending. And uh, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Tuma. That was uh, awesome and super informative. Um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to raise your hand and I can call on you to ask them or type them in the chat. Um, just a quick question I have for you right away, Tuma. Um, did you guys look at all into the river that flows into the north to see if there were healthy populations of Gonfanema clevii? Uh, actually, we have not done that, but that's a very good question, I think, because I will be back to Lake Tanganyika, so that's something I could work on. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for bringing that up. We actually haven't done anything like that. Probably somebody has done, but I don't know of anyone. Yeah. Sure. Um, uh, Leila, you have a question? Yes, uh, uh, thank you, uh, th thank you, Tuma. Uh, I wanted to ask you if, uh, if you, oh, uh, I hope you hear me. Yeah, um, I'm here. Yeah, I hear you. Okay, um, I wanted to ask you if uh, uh, in the lamination, the dark one and uh, the white one, uh, you have different uh, diatom assemblage. Um, uh, for example, in Mpunga Lake, uh, I have the same lamination and uh, the white uh, lamination is very rich in uh, Nietzsche, but it's not the same Nietzsche, it's uh, less silicified one. Uh, and uh, the dark one is more rich with the uh, Olacozeira. Uh, and for uh, Gonfone and Mike Levy, I have it uh, in both, but uh, uh, less abundant. So uh, have you noticed any difference between dark and white uh, lamination? Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for that question. And uh, actually, we, I took some of the samples for these laminations. But I haven't had a chance to do that. Yeah, it's probably so. Looking at the two-way graph, or looking at the two-way, it's mostly Nitsia lacastra. It's mostly one species that dominated this part, and uh, I'm not so sure if maybe the you know we did our resolution was kind of low. So maybe if we did each lamination, it's possible that we would find the different types of needs here. But yeah, thank you. I think that tells me something about, yeah, I'm learning something from that. So maybe I'll have time to look at that and uh, see exactly what the difference is. Thank you so much for that question. Thank you, Tuma. Thanks, Leila. Um, it looks like uh, Mark Edlin has a question. Uh, th thanks, thanks, Tuma, for interesting, uh, an interesting presentation on a, a big lake I've never, I've never gotten a chance to work on before. I was really intrigued by the, the connection with your, uh, your deep water renewal, which was, you know, f finally uh, sort of the, the driving force in, in some of your data, um, and how that, 
uh, in, in some ways connected very, very, very similarly to some of the processes that uh, occur in Lake Baikal, which is, you know, obviously a much more uh, north temperate system um, where deep water renewal is also a, a driving force. Um, one of the questions I had um, goes back to sort of the, the plankton dynamics. I think it was in your Southern Basin Corps where you, you had sort of broad scale shifts between the uh, Nitsia lacustris and um, Cyclostephanus. I didn't, I didn't catch sort of what the, you know, what the, what that sort of century scale shift that was occurring um, within that, you know, within the plankton dynamics there to, to, you know, sort of radically shift the dominance from, from one to the other. So is that in the, in, in this core? I was thinking at that 2A, that 2A you were just showing with the, the blue. Oh, yeah. There. So this one right here. Yeah, where you, you see sort of century scale um, shifts in dominance between um, Nitsia lacustris and uh, your, your Cyclostephanus. Yes. Um, what, what, what might, any ideas what might sort of drive those, um, those that level of, of variation in, your, in the cores? Yeah, that's a very good question because I don't know the answer. Uh, yeah, we realize that really there is a kind of essential scale yeah, shift in dominance, but we don't know exactly what happened during this time. And uh, I'm now working on diatoms from Lake Tanganyika again. And I think, yeah, that, that gives me new knowledge and maybe I might look into this. Yeah. yeah, but for now I cannot tell exactly what caused this kind of shift in assemblage. Do you, yeah. um, I assume both of these species are still present in the lake. Is there any, anything about the, the modern ecology that might um, give us some hints as to yeah. uh, how they might, uh, why, why so they might make those kind of, or why they made those sort of historical? Um, right, so currently the lake is dominated by Nitya lacustris and Astero, it's, it's a tongue twister, Asterorohides, something like that. But then also at the mouths of rivers, is where we have more of Cyclostephanus and, and Alcocera. So the modern datum assemblage is mostly dominated by, I mean, in the pelagic part of the lake, it's mainly by Nitsia lacustris. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, I think using, yeah, using the modern ecology would be a very helpful tool. And yeah, I knew by presenting at this, that on web academy, I would learn a lot, and that's one of the things I'm learning. So thank you so much. What was the just out of curiosity? What what was the sort of the resolution, the time uh, temporal resolution of your of your your sampling intervals? Was it? Yes, we did two centimeters. Okay, and uh, yeah, that was about twenty to thirty years. Oh, okay. So it was a very low resolution, but I'm now working on a resolution of five to ten years. So I'm increasing the resolution, although it's on a, on different cores, but I want to see these decadal changes in the atom assemblages. Very interesting. Thank you for your presentation. Yeah, thank you so much for your questions. Yeah, Tuma, I'm glad you're learning a lot because I'm learning a lot and I think that's what we're all here to do. So really appreciate it. Um, I have a question in the chat from, and I'll get to you, Sarah. I don't hope your arm doesn't get tired. Um, uh, Peter Hallett says, um, does volcanic gas play any role in uh, lake mixing in the Rift Valley? Mm. Thank you for that question. And uh, I'm not sure when the last uh, volcanic eruption happened, or I cannot tell with certainty how active the Rift Valley is. And uh, unfortunately, I'm not so much of such a geologist to know exactly how that's happening. Yeah, so I'm not in position to really answer that question. Yeah, I see Andy, Andy actually responded in the chat and said yeah. that Tanganyika is not volcanic. So I'm guessing yeah. there's not as much interplay there. Yeah, um, thanks Andy. 
I, I just got to Sarah in the chat, and since you have your hand up, I'll let you go ahead and uh, ask your question. Thanks, David, and and thank you, Tuma. Um, really um, fascinating system with this meromictic lake and anoxic bottom waters. And um, if I understand it right, it sounds like you're describing that. Um, so 1500 years ago, there was a distinct uh, change in um, in becoming in less surface temperature in surface temperature and also yeah. are, are in in precip to to uh, reduce streams that would be in the southern part of the lake. Are you saying both those things increased temperature and decreased precip or just so at least we know that for 6a core which covers the mid holocene we know the mid holocene was a warmer kind of time period and uh, most of it was actually the during the african humid period so there was more rain but then we are not so sure about the 1500 years ago how it was but from tierney at all from other literature they say that this is the time when lake surface temperature was high. So all we know here is lake surface temperature, but we don't have enough data for precipitation. Mm -hmm. So this about the, the streams, this one is an assumption after we realize, I mean, the question was, how did the Gonfonima Cleve get to such deep sites? Then probably they came with maybe turbidites. And uh, turbidites are mostly, you know, caused by maybe high precip or something like that. Mm -hmm. So it was that's it was just that's what we suggest, but we are not hundred percent sure that's what happened. Mm -hmm. We don't have enough data for precip during that time. If that was um, the initiation of a prolonged period of drought at the southern end of the lake, would there be any? Um, you know, sort of surface geomorphological evidence of streams um, becoming desiccated or, or um, you know, being essentially frozen in their, their dried out state. I don't know, just trying to imagine what, how you yeah. know that. Actually, you are right. We should investigate more on this. Unfortunately, I haven't been back to the lake since I did this research. And uh, today we have so many people living around the lake and they could have you know, destroyed some of the evidence. Mm -hmm. But investigating this would be really helpful because you know, we cannot just say that there were streams and then in reality, we don't have any evidence for the streams. So this was kind of, it told us something that we should investigate that maybe there were streams. And then I think we can go back and find some evidence. I mean, just like previous research that Andy did, they realized that probably Lake Rukwa, which is next to Tanganyika, was flowing into Lake Tanganyika. And then they went and tried to find the evidence. And of course they did. So I think that's one way of doing this, maybe trying to find the evidence that there were streams that maybe dried out. Okay, thank yeah, you so, so much. That, that's a very good addition, and I'm so happy that I'm dealing with people who know this. So I'm, <laughs> I'm learning a lot. That's <laughs> that's why these yeah. things are so fun. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Tuma. Yeah, Tuma, I just wanted to say in the chat, we have uh, Thomas and uh, Kyle who have both said thank you. Great presentation, cool topic, awesome presentation. Um, I want to try to make. Uh, Jeffrey Stone talk real quick. And I'm just curious if you were referring to the silica concentration um, in relation to the, the assemblage change or the, the colors of the core. Sorry, may you repeat that question? Now I'm muted, I couldn't hear Jeffrey, but I was, I was asking Jeffrey what he was asking or uh, referring to in the silica concentration, whether he's talking about the color changes in the core or the phytoplankton assemblage changes. Let's see, maybe he'll type. Yeah. I still can't hear you, Jeffrey. You do all the streaming and we can't hear you. <laughs> all right, well, if you wanna type your answer, I'll, I'm just curious if you were talking about the course. Um, 
does anybody else have any other questions? Oh, he's, he was helping answer more. All right. And we did have one question that was also uh, in, answered in the chat. Uh, Betul, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. She says, uh, thank you for the presentation and um, and, or, and was asking whether the, uh, about the relationship between ostracods and diatoms and could the gonfanema provide oxygen at this depth or is there a light limitation? And Andy followed up by saying that the photic zone only extends 70 to 100 meters. And so there would definitely be light limitation at these depths. And I'll still be uh, very interested if you go and survey the river and find the gonfanema clevii there. Yeah, thanks, Andy, for answering the question. Um, and, and kind of following up on the discussion uh, Jeffrey Stone's having, he says, silica concentrations are usually associated with weathering and runoff, so there are probably some relationship between precipitation and silica concentrations. Um, did you guys happen in your geochemistry of the cores to measure silica or biogenic silica in the cores? No, actually, we did not do that. So, so we really just have the, uh, I guess, the density of diatoms to go off. Yeah, of. yeah, that's why I was saying we. It's kind of a challenge at times if you don't have biogenic silica, and we relied on that on concentration just because we have, you know, the systems are dominated mostly by a few on species. That's why we relied on that on concentration, but it's also kind of a challenge. We should have done biogenic silica, but you know, we are limited in time and resources and a lot of stuff, but that's a very good addition. Oh yeah, you've, you've done an awesome job with, with what you've had available. So yeah, no, no yeah, criticism thank you. there. Um, yeah. Ewan Reavy asks, is there any sense whether it was also limited during the Alcacyra times? And I'm guessing um, you're meaning silica there? That's right, it's silica limited. Yeah, whether it was silica limited. So here it looks like it might be phosphorus limited. I'm not so sure if it was silica limited. Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. And I guess on, in the note of silica organisms, um, Jeffrey is saying uh, that there's a lot of freshwater sponges in Lake Malawi. I don't know if you saw any freshwater sponge spicules in Tanganyika. A lot, there were a lot, yeah. Um, Layla asks, do you have a modern analog for your Olicocyra? She has a very similar Olicocyra um, in Lake Mount Kenya, and she wonders about the odd ecology. So uh, are the Olicocyra present in the lake today? Yeah, we have Olicocyra, but most of them are just close to the rivers where there is external nutrient input. So I haven't done any modern ecology of the diatoms, but that would be something good to do. Maybe I'll talk with Jeffrey and then we'll see how we can do this. I'll, I'll bring some samples, at least we do the modern ecology and see. So, so when we send you back to Tanganyika, you're gonna scrape a rock in the river and you're gonna take a plankton toe out in the lake. Yeah, I'll be happy if you can send me back to Lake Tanganyika. <laughs> Yeah, I, I will do that. At least I'll come with more samples. I, I just haven't had a chance to be back, but you know, this is so exciting. After you, you know, after you find this, you want to do something else, but you are just limited by time and other factors. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think we will uh, wrap things up for today. Thank you very much, Tuma. Everybody, give Tuma a round of applause. Um, you did a great job today. Um, if you, uh, um, the talk will be uploaded to uh, YouTube just shortly. And um, if you'd like to join us again in two weeks, uh, Matt Ashworth will be speaking to us about Odontella. And um, look forward to seeing you all then. Um, thanks and have a great day.
Thank you.